Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shule. I'm a third-year student in international relations in this university. And today we are here to learn about careers in international relations. So maybe we will have a new idea for our future. Why do we need this idea? Because, as all we know, before we start to study, we don't know have, have exactly one. We don't have exactly one idea what are we going to be after graduation. And uh, you can easily imagine, uh, international relations is not open major which gives you just uh, one job. Like, for example, if you study computer science, uh, obviously you will be the engineer. But it's not like that in international relations. And I think international relations is a balance between um, balance between politics, economics, and the public relations, and which opens a huge, huge opportunities for students in the future. Further than that, students of international relations have more material to solve nowadays problems than any other students. And also, it's our gift since the beginning when we could have changed to try its more field then uh, they have final decision about our life after. So, for a deeper direction, I would like to invite very important speaker who, all, who we all probably know, uh, but those who, you, who don't know him, I will not um, say much about him, but let him introduce uh, himself. And Professor Zorbas, please welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to start with a systematic description of uh, career possibilities in international relations. That could be obvious for some of you, but probably for not for all of you. So it uh, can, could also be helpful. Then I'm going to give you recommendations. Uh, based uh, on my knowledge of the world and my personal experience to some degree. And the most important advice will be at the end. But first, let me introduce myself because uh, this topic, careers, seems to require a personal approach. So, what is my background? Why? do I dare to advise you? I have a diverse background in international relations. Uh, first, I studied in two countries, on two continents, in two regions of the world. My main education in international relations is from the United States of America, from two universities, uh, very well known uh, for teaching and doing research in international relations. One is Georgetown University, the other Johns Hopkins University, uh, both located in Washington, the capital of the United States. Johns Hopkins is a vast university with several campuses. I studied uh, in Washington. I also did research in both of those universities, in their research institutions, uh, plus in another continent, another region, and that was Japan, Tokyo, the capital of Japan. Then I worked as a diplomat in Poland, in the Polish Foreign Service, and uh, in defense policy in the Polish uh, Ministry of national defense. That was an important experience in public service, uh, in public administration, in governmental work. Then I was uh, active, and I still am, in non-governmental organizations, uh, including uh, some that uh, deal or, or dealt uh, in the past uh, under uh, sometimes very different and stormy conditions uh, with international relations uh, and uh, with national minorities and ethnic minorities uh, with issues which are usually very difficult. 
And finally, I work in the media, not uh, full-time. I never was a full-time journalist, uh, but talking and uh, writing for the public, uh, influencing the public opinion in such direct way is also a vital experience. And by the way, you can uh, pronounce my first name in English as Gregory, because Grzegorz in Polish is uh, hard, I realize that. So Gregory Zorbas is the easy uh, way to call me. And now the systematic description. The, the major sectors uh, or markets for careers in international relations split into two major parts. One is public, one is private. I think both are highly worth of consideration for you. Not just private, not just and only public. Both are internally diverse and highly rewarding. The public market splits into two parts itself. One is domestic or national and one is international. Fully, truly, completely international. The national part uh, consists of, first, the foreign service of each nation, each state. Uh, then other services or organizations or institutions of many branches of government, including the uh, parliamentary branch, uh, legislative branch, uh, in the judicial branch, and there are also other independent institutions beyond the traditional division into three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. For example, central banks, which uh, are separate and independent from all the traditional branches. This is a new phenomenon and it creates a lot of jobs. For example, there is a new building under construction for the European Central Bank, which serves the 17 countries of the Eurozone. And one number, the cost of this new building is going to be 1.2 billion euros. Billion euros. You can imagine how many people will work in it and how well will, be, uh, will they be paid. Uh, the European Central Bank, by the way, is not the largest central bank uh, in the world uh, and national central banks are often much bigger. Uh, then there's also a, a, another kind of variety or, di or diversity. Not only central governments create jobs in international relations, also regional and local governments. Uh, this is often forgotten or overlooked, but it's important. And uh, for example, in European countries, many regions, many cities, and even smaller uh, units of territorial self-government uh, have specialized uh, institutions, offices, departments uh, for international cooperation, for minority, ethnic, and similar uh, intercultural issues. And this is all part of the, the job market, the career market in international relations. And now, uh, general characteristic of the domestic uh, public market, it is usually almost all, always reserved for the nationals of each country, for the citizens of each country. But, especially on the regional and local level, there are exceptions. And some countries, 
uh, allow people who are not citizens but have uh, the status of permanent residents to work uh, in the public service, the public administration, and for Europe, for example, even to run in elections for local and regional offices. Then there is the truly international part of the public job market. Uh, the most exclusive one, uh, but uh, also highly attractive, and uh, with many possibilities also over, uh, often overlooked. Uh, I mean international organizations which are intergovernmental or interstate, not non-governmental. This is another and also important part of the story. International organizations like the United Nations, the European Union could be treated as an international organization, although it is not exactly one, and many, 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 many others, about a thousand, about a thousand interstate organizations existing, functioning in the world, they have many niches. Uh, which are maybe uh, may look like especially created for uh, specific persons. For example, inter interstate organizations usually have an ideal, sometimes a formal rule of res representativeness. They want their employees, their staff, to represent all the member countries. And in the case of global organizations, this means almost 200 countries, 193 member states of the United, States, United Nations, for example, and another one in the process of joining. Very often, a citizen, a national of a, even a very small country, far from being a superpower or a great power, can find his or her niche easily in an international interstate organization. It's very worth looking, actively searching for such possibilities. Then the second big market, private. Private doesn't always mean commercial, but commercial is uh, the largest uh, segment of it, starting with business, businesses, international corporations, but also other corporations, national, local corporations, and even small and medium-sized enterprises involved in international trade and other, other kinds of economic cooperation, international economic uh, cooperation. Uh, more and more frequently, even the smallest enterprises, those uh, hiring a couple of employees, uh, do participate in the international economic exchange, especially in Europe and in, in the European Union and in some other highly uh, integrated uh, regions uh, of the world. And your knowledge of international relations uh, can be highly attractive for such even small employees. Then there are some sectors uh, or industries, uh, sectors in the sense of specific industries, which are more international than others. Uh, some are financial. Banking and financial, other financial services are highly international and will be more and more international. Then there's energy. Energy is... Uh, perhaps the most 
internationalized and globalized sector of all major sectors, excluding some minors like movie making or something uh, in Hollywood. Uh, among the major sectors, energy, all with all kinds of energy, from nuclear to renewable, uh, is highly promising uh, as a source, a creator of jobs in international relations. Another and obvious is transportation. Maybe less obvious is consulting. Uh, the, uh, lar the fastest growing part of the global economy is services. And among services, tourism and consulting. Tourism is another sector requiring knowledge uh, in international relations, but uh, consulting uh, is uh, also <laughs> ambitious and uh, exciting, especially the intercultural services for business. How uh, to advise, uh, how to uh, facilitate uh, businesses uh, to conduct uh, their activity, their business, to do their business internationally. They very often don't know. They make major mistakes. For example, they usually have no idea, just zero, how to negotiate across cultures, across cultural differences, cultural barriers. And this is something we teach in this school. Then there are the media. Uh, the media can be considered part of the commercial or for-profit uh, market, but not all the media are for profit, and even being for profit, being corporations, uh, the media have different rules. They are uh, sometimes more civilized, uh, not uh, so uh, strongly focused uh, on greed as businesses, unfortunately, often are. The media are more idealistic. Uh, they resemble, to some degree, the non-profit sector. Uh, one important uh, advice here about the media is that there is a global process of media convergence. The traditional division, you probably know that, but just in case, as a professional, uh, the traditional division into the press, uh, the television, the radio, and the internet, and some other uh, kinds, types of media is disappearing. Uh, the future of media is one content distributed through all the possible platforms. Traditional, like paper, printed paper, and highly advanced, like, like mobi mobile multimedia devices. And this is all uh, governed, dominated by the same content. Who, he who has, or she, who has the content is the king or the queen of media. Uh, this is the future, not uh, fully realized yet, but the world of the media is going into that direction and fast. Then, non Profit, the non-profit part of the public, uh, private uh, job market. Uh, Non-governmental organizations are probably the largest part of it. Both international non-governmental organizations, or INGOs, and just NGOs, uh, based in nations, within nations, countries, but having international interests and 
activities, uh, like uh, dealing with intercultural issues within a country, sometimes within a city or a region, even a town. Uh, and there are many, <coughs> very many fields of activity of both international NGOs and national or regional and local NGOs uh, involved in international uh, relations. Uh, some are charitable, some provide humanitarian assistance of many kinds. Uh, those are so highly valued that, that they are considered part of the international system and nobody can imagine the world without them. Some deal with human rights, uh, focusing on many areas like freedom of speech, freedom of the media, or uh, more basic uh, human rights like the right to live. Uh, some deal with cultural matters, uh, some with uh, science and education and so on and so forth. There is a, a virtually unlimited catalog of fields of activity. And then there is the intellectual part, uh, purely intellectual part, which are think tanks and universities and other schools or more broadly institutions or organizations of education, especially higher education. Education is a major field of business, not purely non-profit. Some educational institutions in some think tanks are for profit, but this is rather an exception than the rule. And uh, education will be in growing demand worldwide. Uh, in my view, in my forecast, uh, education, international education, uh, will be the fastest growing of all sectors. No longer tourism or consulting. Education. For many, many years. Maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe many more. And now, recommendations. What are the priorities for all the students of international relations, in my view, a former student of international relations in several schools in several years? This is not in the order of importance. These are equal priorities, three equal, equally important priorities. First, languages. A major and often catastrophic weakness of job applicants in international relations is poor knowledge of languages, except the mother tongue. English is universal, we all know that, and my advice for you is to perfect your English. Make it perfect or almost, nearly perfect. It may be hard, but there's no other way. Without perfect or almost perfect English, you will be disadvantaged for your all lives, all careers, all career attempts. But English is not enough uh, to make a su successful career usually. Again, there are exceptions, but usually requires at least two major languages. And the other should be major or rising languages of global importance. And those are French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, and Chinese. And there are also languages important regionally, not as important as those, but highly. 
German in Europe, Japanese, uh, in East Asia and with some global uh, use uh, utility uh, to it uh, Portuguese in Latin America and some others. In my schools of international relations in Georgetown University and Johns Hopkins University languages were considered a vital part of education. Uh, we, the students, uh, learned languages intensely. Uh, the schools made major efforts to uh, build uh, advanced learning spaces to hire native speakers to do all possible and more to assure that the graduates speak foreign languages perfectly or nearly perfectly. This is the best model. Another priority is a diverse curriculum of your studies and of the experience you gain through internships, volunteering, travels, academic exchange, and other means. You need to be flexible for the future. It's very hard to plan a single path uh, for the rest of your lives. And uh, knowing the world, knowing international relations uh, from many viewpoints, uh, having experience from many regions or countries or fields of work will help you catch and explore, recognize and explore the niches which may be open for you in the future. Finally, the third recommendation is somehow contrary to the second one, because I'd like to identify some fields of knowledge which I consider uh, part of the core. Uh, in most cases, your possible careers will require at least some knowledge, at least basic knowledge of economics, international law, and intercultural relations. So use, I recommend, all the possibilities, especially if you can select uh, courses, to learn at least some of those economics, especially international economics. But it's hard to understand international economics without basic economics, of course. Then international law, which again requires some knowledge of national or domestic law, and intercultural relations or intercultural dialogue or intercultural negotiations, a subfield, uh, or maybe just some major cultures. For example, the European culture or uh, the Middle Eastern or Islamic culture and other major cultures of the world. Finally, the recommendation, the advice I consider the most important. There are two possible career strategies for the students of international relations. One is to get ready, to get prepared for a dream job. You can plan that you want to be a president of an international bank in 30 years from now, or maybe 20. Uh, and you may concentrate all your efforts on that single objective 
uh, select schools and courses and internships and everything around that. You may want to fit the ideal. It's not the only strategy. And I'm not sure if this is the best strategy in, in international relations. The world is too complicated, it's too rich, too diverse for a human being to predict everything, to optimize his or her plans in a young age for the rest of the life. There's another strategy, searching from the unique places waiting for you, for your niches, one or more. You may try to find the ideal that fits you. And you may use your, character, your background as your strength, starting with your citizenship or nationality. There are jobs open only for the nationals of certain countries. Our nationality is, can be preferred in the job openings. One obvious case, uh, other than in international organizations, is if an, a corporation or an, an NGO, an INGO, opens a regional or local office branch in your country, for example looking for employees who are not, who have much more than just local education and local knowledge. Uh, such corporation or NGO may look for people with international knowledge and international experience, especially multicultural experience. Uh, you may get uh, unique opportunities thanks to that. Other parts of your background can also be vital. Your education, your professional background, your educational background, professional background, your involvement in public affairs, public activism sometimes is decisive. Your personal background, uh, your attitudes, uh, your background in uh, intercultural or multicultural uh, environments, all that may count. Uh, from my career history, uh, how did I become a diplomat? I was involved in the solidarity movement. That was a national movement for democracy and independence of Poland. We liberated Poland from the Eastern Bloc, the Communist Bloc. We changed the system from totalitarian into democratic. And the leaders, and not just leaders, the activists of that revolution entered the government. I, from my political activity in the Solidarity Movement, went almost directly to diplomacy because the new Poland, the uh, new independent and democratic country required new people to conduct its foreign policy. There may be similar possibilities for many today's students of international relations. In searching for your places, your unique places, unique niches, you may be positively surprised many times. There's no guarantees, there are no guarantees, nothing is guaranteed in the world, nothing, but there are opportunities, there are chances there are probabilities of success and you may maximize the probability of your success in your career in IR. Finally, I'd like to recommend a book. There are many good books, but we, uh, the library just bought 
several copies of a book written and published in Georgetown University. Uh, some chapters are useful only for Americans, but most chapters for everybody, for the citizens of all the countries of the world. The title of the book is Careers in International Relations, exactly like the title of our today's meeting. Uh, it was written by professors and by young graduates who became young professionals in international relations and all they studied in the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service like I did years ago. Thank you, now it's time for the questions. I have uh, one question. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask about, uh, about your career path, not your, I mean, like generally career path choice. For instance, someone who's uh, trying to take a path in politics and maybe they pursue a bachelor's in like international relations or economics, for instance. But later on, they decide to do a master's in say political science. And um, this political science, uh, masters can enable them to go into the political arena, but what happens in the case that they are not able to succeed in this field, then they decide to work in the private sector. Can this political science master's degree open some doors for them in, in the private sector? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, this is probably not a large niche, but uh, it's considerable. For example, Political scientists are very useful for making forecasts, including economic forecasts. It's just an example, uh, but a, an important example, I think. Many political scientists in the world work analyzing the uh, political, social, economic, and other conditions in the regions of the world, uh, in the countries, uh, in the regions of the countries, uh, predicting uh, political stability, uh, economic development, which depends on uh, public policy and on political conditions as much as on purely economic uh, circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, this is an interesting uh, a career from which it's possible to re-enter politics, especially foreign policy. Yes? Who's next? Yeah, me. Uh, I also had a question. Like, um, you've, you've explained that um, it's a probable, uh, I mean, it requires probability. I mean, it, it deals with probability to get a career in international relations. It doesn't take one aspect of it, but it takes different aspects of it. So as you were mentioning the aspects, you also tied to multiculturalism. Uh, I was wondering, like, could you please give a few examples of careers that you may get through international relations in, uh, in as far as multiculturalism is concerned? In international relations, uh, could you repeat the last words? Yeah, as far as multiculturalism is concerned, did you mean multiculturalism or knowing of other cultures? Because uh, what I wanted is the clarification of whether you meant multiculturalism like to have a background in different cultures or to yes. know different cultures. Yes. Which one did you exactly mean between the two? Uh, Take diplomacy. Or maybe an even better example is international business, which has a larger job market. Uh, for a European corporation, which uh, has uh, no prior experience uh, in doing business in China or Japan or uh, India, 
and uh, even regions uh, closer culturally like Latin America, it is virtually impossible uh, to succeed without uh, professional advice, professional consulting, which can be provided by uh, outside companies or in-house by hiring competent people. For example, people who studied and worked in several regions of the world or who are of uh, origin, national, ethnic origin from the region of interest. Uh, another example of uh, the usefulness of diversity is not intercultural but interdisciplinary. Uh, for example, many diplomats and many, in, many uh, employees or civil servants of inter, interstate organizations have a background in non-governmental organizations. Uh, there are some ministers of foreign affairs in the world who began their careers in international relations as social activists or journalists, which allowed them to learn the world in practice. They not just traveled as tourists, uh, they gained a much deeper insight of other cultures, other regions, other countries. This is something that can't be just taught in a lecture room. Uh, you can't uh, gain such a deep insight and definitely you can't gain practical uh, abilities uh, to, for a, in an intercultural dialogue, for example, from books and lectures and multimedia presentations. Uh, direct contact with other people and other peoples and other places uh, is the most valuable uh, kind of experience and people with it often succeed in international relations in practical applications which means jobs, just jobs, professional activity. Is this an answer to your question? Thank you. Who's next? We have five, six minutes left. Please ask. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you have your own advice for your colleagues. Well, I'll just yes? Uh, actually, I'll say a few words as the director of the Intercultural and Social Club in this university. And this is mostly to some of our attendants who are from the uh, prep school. Uh, my words would just be of encouragement, as the professor said, about the languages, especially English language. For me, I think in this university, unlike uh, many universities in Warsaw, there's a very huge chance of improving your English because you have a lot of international students who can speak English. But what I noticed is that they, they, there is a lack of practice because there's not so much integration between the people in the prep school and the people who are studying in, in, uh, in the university. So my words of encouragement would just be to encourage you to be able to integrate with, uh, with the students. We have clubs like the Intercultural and Social Club. This is one of our goals, like to create this platform for people to integrate. 
Um, most people even here, like maybe they're scared to stand up and ask questions because they're not confident enough that their English is, is good enough. But this is not the case because even for some of us, it's not like our English is perfect, but we improve with practice. So English is a very important um, language and I would really advise you to improve it. So use the Intercultural and Social Club as a platform for, for this. So these are the only few ways I had. I think it's an excellent activity which uh, serves the purpose uh, of uh, gaining active command of English and maybe other languages. Uh, in theory, you could get through all the schools just by passive knowledge of English or other languages. Uh, you can read, you can uh, listen to the lectures, and you can uh, then uh, pass uh, choice tests which don't require uh, any writing, just you select the answers, and this all creates an illusion that you know English or French or whatever, Russian or Chinese. It's just an illusion. What you really need is using the languages actively. Writing, talking, making presentations in class, for class. I always require presentations uh, or other types or essays or other types uh, of uh, uh, active use of English, as well as Polish in my Polish language uh, classes. Uh, this makes life more difficult now, but will make it much easier and successful for the future. Yes, please. Yeah, I also had final remarks regarding uh, what has been said collectively. I mean, collectively, but there was also an important point that you stressed. Now uh, you said, in this world, we can't wake up being young and think of something that we'd like to do in the future, and exactly it goes that way after going to school. Um, most of my colleagues will agree with me that they've seen different people who have been trying to achieve a certain goal, but they haven't. So, like he said uh, concerning uh, intercultural and social club and social integration, this is the first step to achieving your career goals. For example, you want to be, let's say, a president, but you don't know how to speak in public. You can't start speaking in public in front of uh, 20,000 people. You can start by a small group of people, then extend to a larger group of people, to larger circles. So the very first thing that is needed to achieve your career goal is to delve into it, to get in it, to try doing what you like to do at a small scale and increasing as your intelligence grows. So for those of you who are pursuing these um, international relations or uh, English philology as well, it's really important that you start doing it now because there's no way you can learn by going to class, sitting there, listening to something. You can't deliver it. I mean, it's totally different in the professional world. So the very first step is to start doing it before you become it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This is 100% true. <laughs> thank you for your attention. And <laughs>